Hello? Hello? I think this one works. Some works. Some works. Hello Cosmos, can we test your video please? This is Samir uh, from the venue, or Christine is there on your behalf kindly. Yes, Cosmos, we can see your video, very good to see, but can I ask my team here to kindly check the audio also? I'm not able to hear, team. Can you increase the volume, please? Uh, can you speak, uh, Cosmos? <coughs> yes, very well, very well. So, Yes, give us a second, uh, Cosmos. So maybe if uh, people are returning after lunch, and uh, I think in the interest of time, and also I note uh, that you have to go somewhere. So let me uh, welcome back uh, colleagues and friends after lunch. I hope you enjoyed a good lunch. The morning session was very exciting, and uh, I apologize, uh, they were uh, very less seats or so people were standing there which shows perhaps they have a lot of interest in our session so very grateful for the patience and understanding and in this afternoon session uh, we before we start uh, thematic session number two on digital inclusion and education we have the pleasure and privilege uh, to have our colleague uh, dr cosmos zava zava he is the chief partnership of digital development and he's also Director, Telecommunications Development Bureau elect uh, for sharing his remark. Uh, suffice to say, in the morning when I introduced uh, Dr. Zava Zava, uh, apart from the Chief and Director of BDT elect, he was also the member of the jury of Connect to Recover. So, without further ado, uh, Dr. Zava Zava, the floor is yours uh, to uh, share your remarks. Thank you.
Dr. Zawazawa, thank you very much for your inspiring remark. And today uh, we saw the launch of all the reports that you finalized uh, as a jury member and also as a chief from the project. We appreciate your support and we look forward to your continued support uh, in uh, implementation of those reports. So with that, can I now pass on the floor for the next uh, session, which is session on digital inclusion. Uh, very uh, interactive session, I believe, very exciting uh, proposals that have been put forward. And I have pleasure and honor to uh, pass the floor to our colleague and partner uh, from Huawei, uh, Dr. Rini. Floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samir. Thank you to all the colleagues at uh, ITU and the great team at Huawei and uh, supporting this research competition. I think it was a great journey for all of us, and um, we were really uh, taken by, well, not by surprise, but we were really, uh, you know, positively impacted um, on every step of the way by the dedication of the ITU team um, to this project. And um, so let me thank you again for your great support. And I would also like to take the opportunity to thank the researchers who have made their way here to others today to present their excellent papers um, with some key results here to our panel because I think this afternoon session is really where we're getting sort of into the specific, uh, specifics of the content of the individual um, research reports and can share and hopefully discuss afterwards um, the recommendations and how we can take this forward um, also with the help of Huawei. So it is my pleasure to um, welcome here today three speakers representing um, three of the project teams. Um, it's Mr. Michael uh, Canaras, strategy advisor uh, from the Philippines. And it's Mr. Hassan Mohamed Yakubo uh, from the School of Architecture, Planning and Design at Mohamed uh, VI Polytechnic University in Morocco. And uh, last but not least, it's uh, Dr. Wond Vosen Mulu Alem Beene, freelance researcher at hand and at Havasa University in Ethiopia here. Um, they all will present on the topic of education and how digital inclusion can foster a better environment for that. And I think we have all learned over the past years that this is one area where digital connectivity and the ability to be able uh, the ability to access education remotely is really paramount um, for the development of nations and of societies. And um, before we get started, let me make a, a quick remark um, uh, with conscience to time. Uh, we'll give the presenters uh, 10 minutes each and we'll give them a short signal um, after seven minutes. So when three minutes are left and when one minute is left through my colleague Andy here sitting uh, just across from me so you can see him. And um, well, with that, no further ado, um, I would give the floor to Michael Canaris. Um, please. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Michael Canaris. I am from the Philippines. I am uh, making this presentation on making higher education truly inclusive. And at the outset, I would like to thank ITU for the tremendous work uh, in shepherding the researchers and also in making sure that we complete our outputs on time. So in terms of presentation outline, um, uh, we will do the same thing as what we did uh, today, uh, this morning. We'll introduce the research team, do some introductions, uh, discuss a little bit of research methodology, uh, discuss the research fi findings and outcomes, recommendations and conclusions as well. We also have a dedicated website for this research that's uh, there, it's inclusive-higher-ed.com. And several of the, uh, the experiences that we have, uh, that we underwent as we conducted the research are also uh, presented there. Um, I am the one conducting this research together with uh, Francois Van from the Center for Research on Evaluation Science and Technology at Stellenbosch University in Africa. Uh, both Francois and I have worked tremendously on the topics of digital inclusion. Uh, our last, uh, our recent paper was published in an edited volume on open data and inclusive development. And this research project is actually an offshoot of that. 
So we know for a fact that uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, a lot of the countries were actually forced into using technology to deliver higher education. So the focus of this paper is actually on higher education, and we would like to see whether or not um, the use of digital technology has actually enabled uh, a more inclusive process of uh, uh, education. Why? Because um, there is the presumption that you know, if you are able to do uh, ICT-enabled education, uh, you will have farther reach. Uh, you can reach uh, people that are not even within classrooms, like what we're doing now. Well, other well, we are presenting here. Others are actually participating remotely, and um, somehow there's a theoretical assumption that you can make education more inclusive with the use of technology. So there are three topics that we would like to uh, that we wanted to cover in this uh, in this paper. The first question that we would like to do is, what is the, what is the response of higher education institutions in uh, during the pandemic? So what was the response of higher education during the pandemic? The second question that we would like to see is, for example, um, with, the, with the current response to higher education, with the use of technology in higher education, has it made delivery of higher education much, much more inclusive? And the third question is, what are the implications of this in the delivery of higher education in the future? Will it actually make us move towards more tech-enabled education delivery? In terms of research methodology, we actually made use of a case study approach because case studies, as you know, have the greatest potential to reveal social technical complexities that are at play in creating inclusive network systems. Um, there are three countries that we selected for this study. We have Philippines and South Africa, primarily because of the reason that uh, both of us are re as researchers are in these countries, but at the same time also, because South Africa was considered the most highly unequal society uh, across globally, I think, in the 2019 study of World Bank. And the second one is that the Philippines is also the most unequal society uh, across Southeast Asia. And then um, we also have seen that there's a growing inequality in both countries and also the expectations of what education can do to contribute to national development. Australia was selected because it presents a more developed and less unequal society. So if you look at OECD uh, ranking for Gini inequality coefficients, for example, uh, Australia seemed to be at the a better end as compared to the other uh, English-speaking countries. So we also have seen Australia to have a lot of papers published during this period on, <coughs> sorry, on, uh, on education delivery in COVID-19 situations. So we selected Australia as a goal or as a, a, a point of reference on how Philippines and South Africa could potentially learn from their experience. So I'll go directly to research findings and conclusion. <coughs> it was, as what was mentioned in the morning by our presenter, this is a 50-page paper that we're trying to actually shrink into a 10-minute presentation. So I would just like to focus on things that we're, we're seeing, for example. So. So in South Africa, what we've, what we've seen is that neither technology nor open resources necessarily led to the anticipated democratization effects. So almost half of the students surveyed, for example, reported difficulties completing assignments or participating in online discussions due to lack of access to computer equipment or an internet connection. As campuses closed and universities pivoted to emergency online teaching, it became apparent that some students either lacked computers or could not afford the data costs to access online resources and teaching platforms. The biggest obstacles to students' engagement with remote learning were network connectivity, data, not having the appropriate devices for studying, and so on. <coughs> but we have to take note that the capacity to adapt, however, is not only a challenge among students. In the Philippines, for example, most teachers had intermediate computer competency, but had no training in online teaching. Despite the drive towards blended learning in the past 20 years, only a few educational institutions have implemented it because of weaknesses in the technological infrastructure. Private universities that are better resourced have the advantage of devising systems and procedures to make flexible learning more adaptive to student needs. Um, the The, 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 <clears throat> the interesting case about South Africa and the Philippines is that in South Africa, it's largely public provision. In the Philippines, uh, education provision is largely, um, largely private. 
Okay, in Australia, um, we have seen, for example, that there's not much inequality, but what we saw in the, in the, the study was that there was perilous position of international students stranded in Australia due to international travel ban. And the government response seemed to be unsympathetic. <coughs> and what we're seeing is that how Australian universities will invent themselves in response to the decline in international students, including the pivot to online and hybrid modes of teaching to maintain or possibly increase delivery to rem remotely located international students who become a challenge. Okay, so for in terms of um, recommendations, sorry, I jumped too quickly. Um, we're, we're, we're having four major areas of recommendation. It's on ICT infrastructure and access, on learning pedagogy, on teaching competencies, and target education support. So for ICT infrastructure and access, in a context where access to technology, not only to the internet, but also to devices, Government should strengthen broadband infrastructure on one hand and access to learning devices on the other. On learning pedagogy, from a pedagogy perspective, there's a need to formulate policies and programs that transition teaching, learning, and assessment from a highly collectivized and traditional system to one that allows individual learning journeys aided by technology. technology. For teaching competencies, the increased use and reliance on digital technologies in education during the pandemic has highlighted the capacity deficiencies on the part of teaching staff. The competency framework for higher education teachers should include using digi digital technology to design, deliver, and assess teaching and learning outcomes. And finally, for targeted education support, higher education policies and programs should provide target education support to institutional providers, teachers, and students based on income or deprivation levels. To conclude, there are three things that we would like to emphasize here. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown that the rapid deployment of the technologies by various stakeholders is possible. Theoretically, the availability of technologies to a broader segment of the population should have resulted to greater inclusion. However, however the evidence provided in this report shows that without capabilities, many of which are non-material, do not relate to technical skills or access alone. And without the acknowledgement of the social dynamics of systems and networks, parts of the population will always remain included. So I'll stop there, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to hand the floor to Mr. Hassan Mohamed Yakubo um, for his presentation. so much thank you so much um, good afternoon to everybody so um, I'll be uh, I'll be doing a presentation on promoting um, digital inclusion in African cities and regions policy frameworks for digital resiliency in education for a better COVID-19 recovery so just as my colleague who, who, who has finished I uh, will be following this um, this outline so I'll begin by doing a, a brief presentation of the project team, um, an introduction of the research project, research methodology, the research findings and outcomes, some recommendations, and then conclusions. So to begin with, um, our research team, as you, as you can see on the slide, uh, is comprised of um, researchers from UN Habitat and the School of Architecture, Planning, and Design, Mohamed Polytechnic University. So it's, com it's, it's comprising of um, architects and urban planners who work on a, a, a wide range of issues relating to, um, relating to ICT in the city, uh, relating to urban planning, um, education, and a whole lot of um, other challenges that affect people at the level of the city and regions. So to begin with, I'll, I'll say um, our, our, our project as, as I mentioned, entitled Promoting Digital Inclusion in African Cities, sought to kind of um, assess the digital divide that was experienced by um, teachers and teachers and learners in, in, in two main African cities, that is Nairobi in Kenya, and then a smaller city, Bengeri in Morocco. So we sought to, uh, to understand the digital divide that, uh, that was experienced at the level of cities and regions, and then from then, once we are able to understand the digital divide that was experienced, we sought to identify 
best practices that could, that, that could be identified at the level of the continent. And from then on, we could, uh, from that, propose uh, policy frameworks of recommendations and key actions that could help in, in situations of pandemics. So concerning the research methodology that we adopted, we, we, we used a, a multiple case study approach whereby we looked at um, the emergency remote education that was deployed in these two main cities. And then we looked at, we targeted schools in these cities as well as um, look, uh, low income communities. So for each city, for instance, the city of Nairobi in Kenya, we looked at um, a low income community where we, 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 we investigated the digital divide that was experienced by, by students in this city. And then we, we selected um, a couple of, of schools comprising of primary, secondary, and higher education institutions where we interviewed, we, we, we explored the digital divide that was experienced by teachers, by teachers and mostly um, headmasters as well, in order to really understand the digital divide that was experienced during the pandemic. And from then on, we could, once we, are, we were able to under, understand the digital divide in education that was experienced, we, we could easily um, propose um, recommendations, solutions that, that would help in, in cases of pandemics moving forward. So as you see, uh, as you could see on the on the slide of our of our research methodology, the first objective, as I said, was uh, to assess the digital divide. So we we targeted um, teachers in in schools and then um, students in low income communities. Then in order to 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 look at best practices, inspiring best practices on the on the level of the continent, we we we, we launched a call for uh, for applications, a call for contributions, uh, where we. We received quite a number of, of interesting um, approaches that were used in bridging the digital divide um, that was experienced by teachers and learners in, in Africa. So from, from our research, um, we, 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 we had very interesting um, findings and, and outcomes from, from, what we, um, from what we did in each of these cities. So in general, um, as, as you could see on the slide, um, we, we got to realize that in terms of, for instance, in terms of, um, in terms of familiarity with, um, with privacy and cybersecurity issues, we realized that in both cities there was not much familiarity. Both teachers and, uh, both teachers and learners didn't have, um, were very familiar with issues of cybersecurity. Um, in terms of um, maybe, um, in terms of, for instance, the affordability of internet connectivity, we realized that, for instance, in Nairobi, um, a household, a household um, had a mean spend of about 12.45 US dollars. That's about 1,500 uh, Kenyan shillings per month on internet connectivity. And in Nairobi, in, in Bengari, the city in uh, Morocco, for instance, we realized that 70% of the households um, had students partaking in emergency remote education. And that meant that, for instance, they, um, about, they spent about one to two hours on average in, in, accessing, um, in accessing emergency remote education. Um, we also realized that, for instance, the number of platforms, the, the common platforms that were used in emergency remote education were, were Facebook, um, YouTube, and WhatsApp. Facebook and YouTube to share videos, and WhatsApp to communicate between teachers and learners. Um, we also realized, for instance, um, education authorities had limited um, resources. They had limited resources um, in terms of um, helping their students to, to connect to, to these kind of platforms and videos. Um, some of the challenges that we also um, that, that we also uh, observed were that um, students were not really uh, abreast with learning online. They were not really familiar with learning online because there was this this abrupt switch from learning physically in classrooms to learning online. So it was quite a, a, a challenge in adapting to to that mode of learning online. And the same the same challenge was also experienced by teachers as well, in that. Um, Yes, they were, they, they, they were used to, to teaching students, but then in terms of teaching online, it's a whole new dynamic. So they had to really adapt to, to, to teaching online. So from, so from our research, some of the recommendations that we, we were able to arrive at in terms of um, helping bridge the digital divide in <coughs> education moving forward, uh, we, we realized that we should adopt a people-centered approach, an approach where we look at people, that is educators and learners, as the key to 
bridging the digital divide. We shouldn't look at the digital devices per se, but then we should look at people. People are at the center of education. So we should look at how the, the key challenges that students and learn, uh, that students and teachers face in, uh, in, in emergency remote education situations so that we could really uh, tackle um, these challenges. Also, um, some of the other recommendations that we um, observed were that we should um, broaden um, internet connectivity to both households and teachers. We should, we should broaden uh, internet connectivity to both households and then to, um, to schools as well. We should establish partnerships um, between <coughs> private sector, government, and uh, local authorities in order to um, provide wider connectivity in terms of education. We should prioritize local, local tools that, that are quite context specific so that um, they'll, be, they'll, they'll easily respond to um, contextual specificities in, in African regions and cities. So to conclude, um, two of the main key um, things that we identified in our research was, was that context is very important in any uh, assessment of digital divide, especially in terms of education. We should understand context specific specificities, that is in terms of issues of connectivity, issues of literacy, they should be, they should be key in uh, identifying in, in identify the digital divide in order to propose solutions. And then that means that we should uh, really partner with local government in order to be able to address um, challenges in terms of rolling out emergency remote education in situations of pandemics. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much. And now we're moving on uh, to a research paper dealing directly with the um, inclusion or digital inclusion in higher education here in the Ethiopian context. Um, I would like to welcome Dr. Von Vosen Mulualem Beyene to the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Wondrosen. Uh, the topic of the research paper I'm, I'm presenting is Determinants of Digital Inclusion in Higher Education, Exploring the Ethiopian Context. Which one is? Okay. No. Maybe somebody can help me to navigate with this one. Okay. So this is how uh, the presentation is organized. First, I introduce the research team, followed by a brief introduction of the research. Then I explain briefly the methodology used in the research. And uh, I will be presenting some of the issues explored in our paper. And then there will be some recommendations. Uh, why th uh, this is the team. My name is Wan uh, I uh, work as a freelance researcher, collaborating with Hawassa University. I, my specialization is in digital accessibility and inclusion. Uh, my friend, Dr. Abraham, is a College, Dean of uh, College of Education at Hausa University, and our friend Samson is a lecturer of uh, communication engineering at the same university. So this is the setup of the team. Uh, why digital inclusion? Why this research? Uh, it's because ICTs help the fulfillment of SDG4, uh, for example, through e-learning to withstand disruptions, so that education can withstand disruptions like the one caused by COVID-19. But the problem is like, uh, mentioned uh, by the ITU 2020 uh, publication or data, only 24% of Ethiopians are internet users, so that's a very low number. Uh, nevertheless, we see projects such as SchoolNet, which is a network of secondary schools, uh, Ethernet, that one is our vision, which is a network of uh, research universities. And we also see uh, inclusive computer laboratories included in the country's education sector development plan. So for this research, we focused on what we believed as gaps, first is the definition of digital inclusion. The way governments perceive and dis define digital inclusion determines the breadth and depth of interventions they would make to realize it. So it's very important. Uh, from the papers we reviewed, we understood that digital inclusion, inclusion is taken mainly as a technical uh, undertaking. We think that that under understanding is incomplete. We also sensed for the need of a digital inclusion policy which is based on a comprehensive understanding of digital inclusion and also some data as evidence from the field. That's what our research tried to offer. So our research aimed at identifying barriers of digital inclusion in education and providing some recommendations. 
the methodology is uh, first we selected five universities, five of the oldest universities in the country. Then we applied exploratory sequential mixed method. So first the interviews were made with university teachers, college deans, ICT directors, disability unit heads, which were selected purposefully. And then we followed that up with the survey data, which was collected from 418 students, undergraduate students, which were selected using stratified proportionate sampling technique. Uh, most of our respondents, like 90% of them, said they have uh, smartphones. Uh, only 45% said, 43% said they have computers. And most respondents say that they depend on their university's ICT infrastructure for uh, internet access. So most of the problems discussed were related to the shared access facilities in the universities. For example, problems like, such as uh, low number, uh, insufficient number of computers in computer laboratories, weak Wi-Fi, uh, slow internet, they were among the problems mentioned. The other major problem was related to digital content. Uh, we can uh, classify the problem as uh, availability, usability, and accessibility issues. For example, when we say availability, there is a great deal of scarcity of digital content uh, in the universities. The universities generally have a very good infrastructure, but there is scarcity of digital content. In addition to that, we, are, we, are, we have also noted a mismatch between what is available and what students want. For example, there is a new generation of students with visual impairment who cannot use braille materials, but the only thing they can find in their universities are braille materials. The other issue is usability, which means lack of one card system. That means users have to do multiple logins to access different digital services. So that was frustrating. And the other is accessibility. It relates to uh, the ability of students with disability to access digital content using assistive technologies. The knowledge of this uh, concept, we saw it requires more work from the universities. The other issue was there were significant number of students, like 10% of them, who said they haven't faced any barriers, including students who say they, they haven't a smartphone or they haven't a laptop. There are some of them who said they haven't faced any barriers. So this tells us that barriers are revealed through usage and activities that require the use of ICT. Uh, so when we you talk about motivation, we have found that the popularity of the least interactive technologies, such as Telegram, by students as well as uh, teachers. When students were asked about their most favored way of uh, sharing information or getting information, most of them mentioned Telegram, and the least popular one was the university portal. So there must be uh, different reasons for this. One reason could be the usability and accessibility issues, which we discussed earlier. Uh, the other is uh, inconsistent practices. That is, a lack, a lack of digital inclusion policy or norms that enforce consistent use of digital <coughs> services. There are also some perce perception issues. For example, some teachers say they don't use learning management systems because they don't expect their students to use them. Uh, some teachers also consider learning management systems as uh, extra workload. When it comes to digital literacy, that was the other topic which was uh, explored in our uh, paper. According to UNESCO, digital literacy is a set of four di different types of literacies, such as computer literacy, ICT literacy, media literacy, and information literacy. So in our survey, all students and all teachers are on, on different levels of digital literacy. That has caused differences in the way uh, uh, ICT materials are used and lesson materials are produced. For example, there are some teachers who produce course content using animations, videos, and there are some teachers who just use PowerPoint presentations, so there is a gap. Uh, so these are the recommendations we have at the end. First, it's important to improve in-campus and off-campus access to ICT. When we say off-campus access, for example, we can think about some community centers like public libraries in rural areas. We can capacitate them to be digital inclusion centers for their communities. Uh, upgrade disability centers to in universities to inclusion centers. There are disability units, but it would, be, it would be important for someone to recommend, design, enforce, and follow up digital inclusion work in the universities. So these centers are the best candidates if they are given the right training and uh, uh, upgrading. Uh, it's important to identify digital literacy needs and plan training programs. It would be better to have a collaboration for this between university libraries, computer centers, and media centers to design and launch 
digital literacy programs. And it would be a good idea if digital literacy is inter integrated in the continuous professional development program, which is underway, which is in place for university teachers. It's also important to work on digital service design and digital content acquisition. When you say digital service design, it's important to focus on users' needs and preferences. For example, we have shown that 90% of our respondents say they use smartphones, so it is better, it's, it's a good idea to develop mobile-friendly uh, products, like, for example, uh, services which can be accessed through mobile easily. And it's important to take steps to, pro to, to produce content in alternate formats so that people with disabilities can be included. For example, in our research, as I mentioned before, uh, they, the, thing they only, the only thing they get if it's uh, braille materials and if they want audio content, that means those people are excluded. So it's very much important to think about uh, producing content in alternate formats. Usage of accessibility guidelines. For example, there are different guidelines out there, like web content accessibility guidelines, and there are many of them there. It's better to think about using those guidelines while designing uh, digital content. And last, motivating ICT use. Whatever uh, investment we make on infrastructure, if that infrastructure is not well used, then it's very difficult. So it's very important to motivate students and teachers, for example, intrinsically through digital literacy programs. Maybe it's extrinsic motivation could be the use of digital inclusion policy that requires consistent use of uh, educational technologies. So in conclusion, in our research, we identified structural, organizational, and personal uh, issues that any digital inclusion effort has to tackle, and a digital inclusion policy that aims at identifying and tackling these issues would be successful to realize inclusion in education. And thank you. Thank you very much to the three presenters. Um, I would like to open the floor for questions. Are there any questions, comments from the audience? So, um, all right, I'll, I don't see any, so I, I will ask a question. Um, and I think one particular issue that resonates with all the three research projects that we've just heard about is where would you see the trade-offs between using existing sort of off-the-shelf solutions that people are already using as compared to um, some of the solutions that we also heard about um, that were either built by the universities themselves or that are more individualized towards the specific learning context. And I could see that, you know, there are pros and cons to using both of them, but I would very much be interested in hearing your thoughts um, on that in term, well, based on your research findings. I probably would like to start uh, in answering that question and we'll give the opportunity to that is to uh, say something as well. Um, so I think uh, you may, may mention a very important point in your paper where you say that it's very important that you understand context to be able to deliver the kind of uh, education that learners actually need and want in a given context. And I think um, the problems with off-the-shelf solutions is that they're not actually designed in such a way that they're actually catering to all sets of contexts. So I think we have to rethink or reframe discussions on pedagogy here. Like, for example, um, how do you design content online that, how, designing a content online <clears throat> cannot be the same as how you design content face-to-face, -face, right? And a lot of those that are off-the-shelf, a lot of off-the-shelf solutions are somehow catered into such kind of uh, uh, such kind of a, 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 a mindset. And the other thing that I think would be useful and to think about is how do you make learning processes more inclusive in that context? Because I think a lot of off-the-shelf delivery systems have, uh, how do you call it, have normal, that's not normal, but have this, a particular set of students in mind. So I, my question would be, how do you ensure that those learning systems uh, will be able to answer the needs of people with disabilities, for example? 
or those people with or students with uh, d differing needs in terms of learning uh, methodology. So yeah, that's up there. Okay. Well, I think it's better. It's very important to focus on uh, users' needs and preferences to build on that. Because if we build products which are not usable, uh, then that would be uh, very difficult. So it would be very important to start what do the students want or how do they prefer content to be delivered from them. That would be a good, a good way to start. Then we, we decide whether to uh, add, uh, customize or uh, uh, deploy those off-shelf products or build something from the, up from the ground. I think I'll just like to add that um, Given the, given the condition under which uh, most of education was held during COVID-19, it was mostly emergency. So that meant that um, if you had proprietary um, platforms, as you mentioned, proprietary platforms would be very difficult because um, you would have to teach students or educators how to use the platform first before you can even think of uh, designing content for that. But then if you used um, existing platforms like Facebook, YouTube, and even WhatsApp, it was quite easy to um, use content that was already designed, that was already in the public domain. So it was quite easy for students to easily get onto YouTube, um, search for videos that they wanted um, to have more exp explanation on, on specific topics. So it was quite easy to use um, existing platforms. So I would say um, existing platforms was quite easy, easily um, used and adapted by students and teachers alike, whereas um, proprietary platforms, it was quite difficult to really um, get it going because of the emergency situation in which we were. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, all right. I think at, at that point we would uh, probably hand it over to the next session um, also in contents of time. And uh, let me thank uh, once more our three speakers. And um, I would like to hand it over to Karen Wu from the ITU for the next session. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have so far covered uh, research reports covering the area sectors of education and healthcare. Now we're looking at enterprises and job creation. COVID-19 pandemic has not only affected the way we work, it also affected businesses. According to UNCTAD survey of businesses in over 100 countries, the vast majority of businesses were affected by COVID-19. 60% of small micro and small enterprises were affected. Um, the evidence also shows that up to 70% of small and medium-sized enterprises increased use of digital technologies due to COVID-19. So this is the other side. Even though they were affected, they also used um, increased use of digital technologies. At the same time, we also know digitalization has the potential to boost firm productivity and job creation. In agriculture, digital technology has the potential to address the challenges faced in the sector, and it is very relevant in this continent. The objective of this session is focuses on opportunities in leveraging digital technology, digital financial inclusion to transform smaller enterprise and advance agriculture sector, and effectively improve jobs and livelihoods. With that, let me introduce you to the three speakers, or four speakers, uh, who will share on this topic. They will each have 10 minutes, um, and then it will be followed by question and answer. The first speaker is uh, Dr. P.K. Senyo, Associate Professor, FinTech and Information Systems, University of Southampton, UK, and he will be co-presenting with Dr. Stan Karanasios, Associate Professor, University of Queensland, Australia, on building resilient micro enterprises with digital transformation. The second speaker uh, is Dr. Torsten Jelinek, Director and Senior Fellow of Taihe Institute, China. He will focus on advancing smallholder agribusiness in Botswana through small digital innovation. And our final speaker is Dr. Reason Masangu, Senior Lecturer, Department of Management Studies, Middle East College, Muscat, 
uh, Oman, who will focus on the digital financial inclusion of micro, small, and medium enterprises of the Comesa region into electronic business during and post COVID-19 pandemic. Let me now pass the floor to the first speaker, Dr. P.K. Sanyo. Thanks, Karen. I hope you can hear me. Yes, uh, thanks to ITU for the funding to do this research and thanks for the opportunity to present our findings. And as Karen said, we will be, I will be presenting with one of my colleagues, uh, Stan, who will join us virtually. So if we could go to the first slide, please. Oh, I used point two. OK. OK. Yes, so that's my team. Uh, we have Stan. So he's associate professor in information systems at the University of Queensland in Australia. And then we have uh, associate professor, John Efa, who is at the University of Ghana Business School. He's associate professor of information systems. And then myself, BK Senyo, who is also asso associate professor uh, at the University of Southampton, where I focus mainly on financial technologies. And I have interest in ICT for development as well, because I believe we can use technology to speed up development in global South countries. So let's begin our presentation. So we are looking at digital transformation of micro enterprises, and we are using Ghana as a case study. So as Karen said, and from other reports, we realized that indeed COVID affected individuals and businesses. Now, whilst there were stimulus package for big organizations, there were also micro organizations. And when we talk of micro organizations, we are referring to very small businesses, a one person business, where the benefits of the business becomes the benefits to the owner. So if I run a very small shop and I'm trading, selling by the roadside, in our definition, we classify you as a micro, uh, a micro enterprise. And most often we find that these organizations do not have the capital, the technology to be able to digitize. And they were the ones who tried, who suffered a lot during COVID-19. And one of the things we also found out was that those small businesses as they are, some are unregistered. So they cannot even access government funding and government support. So these businesses are the ones that had a lot of hate. And in global South countries, majority of enterprises that we have are made up of these businesses. The former sector can only employ uh, just a few. Majority of people go into micro enterprises. So that is why we find micro enterprises as a very important kind of group of businesses. We should see how they digitally transform and how we can support them. And as COVID will prove us right, we realized that some of these businesses suffered, especially those who didn't have the means to digitally transform. So for example, if someone was selling at the side of the street and there's a restriction that stay at home, social distance, don't come out. It means that they cannot sell. And majority of these businesses rely on person-to-person -person businesses. There were no deliveries. They do businesses by cash because they don't probably even have a bank account. So for these reasons, they became the vulnerable set of businesses that suffered a lot. But at the same time, there was also the ability of COVID to push some of these businesses to reinvent their business model and change. And that was what our focus was. was. So for our research, we focus mainly on trying to provide evidence of how some micro enterprises were able to adjust, how some were able to improvise to be able to take advantage of the benefit of the COVID-19 pandemic to be able to become thriving businesses and become resilient for future uh, occurrences. So that's the focus. So we, have a num we had a number of research questions. So the first one was to clearly understand how micro enterprises digitally transform. Because it's unclear, when we talk of digital transformation, majority of the literature is focused on well-established organizations, organizations that have the money to buy the infrastructure. They have the people with the skills. But then when it comes to micro enterprises, like a one-person business, how do they digitally transform? It's unclear. 
we don't know what the literature says. So that's why we want to understand that. Also, through digital transformation, there may be some anticipated benefits and also some constraints and challenges that will come through this digital transformation. So that was another set of questions that we had. And then also, we wanted to understand what sort of support will these micro enterprises need from government, from other players within the ecosystem, because they are not islands on their own. They live in an ecosystem. So we wanted to understand, for example, if you're a business, you will always receive payment. So FinTech is important. The same way, you may also look at other technology firms that will provide you some sort of solution. So how do, can they help you as a micro enterprise? So that was also one of our, our focus. And for this research, one unique way we conducted the research was, even though we're focusing on micro enterprises, we just don't want to talk to only micro enterprises. We want to understand how other players within the industry affect them and how those players could help them. So we took a multi-level approach where we talked to government agencies, we talked to the tech people, we talked to fintechs, Inc., and then we talked to the micro enterprises as well. So the goal of doing that is to kind of get a holistic view of how we could be able to help these micro enterprises to become resilient. So what was our methodology? Because we wanted to not just provide a descriptive account of what was happening, we actually wanted to understand the in-depth interrelationships. What are the relationship between the various actors and how would that have an effect on the micro enterprises? We largely followed a qualitative research approach because there was a number of complexities there that you couldn't just use a quantitative approach to address. So mainly, we focus on the qualitative research. In addition to that, we also did a bit of quantitative, but that was mainly secondary data analysis, where we look at country level data. So we look at the Ghana Statistical Service, what have they done uh, in respect to micro enterprises, the World Bank. And we look at all these data to sort of provide, provide us with some sort of context before uh, moving on to our main data collection. So for the data collection, we talked to 30 micro enterprises. We talked to one government agency, but we had over five interviews. Then we talked to MNOs. MNOs are like uh, mobile money providers, so those who offer payment solutions in the global south. And then also we talked to technology firms as well. So we wanted to understand how they influence the micro enterprises. So just to provide a bit of background, this is the ecosystem of how the payment landscape looks like, for example, in Ghana, where you have the central bank who regulates the MNOs, also regulate the fintech firms and the banks. Then you have mobile money. So mobile money is largely, it's a technology that allows you to be able to uh, perform financial transactions without the need for a bank account. So your phone number becomes your pseudo bank account and you can send and receive money. And it's very popular in the global south. Uh, sorry, Dr. P.K. Senyo, yes. you have three minutes left. Okay, <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of the environment. And then we have the merchants who are part of that environment. Then you have digital informal businesses who were not initially included, but they have to find ways to appropriate. So that's kind of how the environment looks like. At this point, I'll hand over to my colleague Stan, who will then wrap up. Stan, if you can take over. Can you put on your, uh, can you enable Stan um, technical support?
But they, thank you. Oh, that's much better. So we aimed quite big, um, um, say, okay, what can some of the current or latest technology, how can it help actually to transition uh, the African continent towards an inclusive and competitive di digital economy? Uh, that was the assumption by using what we here call as a federated digital platform that basically means um, the issue of data sharing and platforms has been addressed. Um, um, so we didn't look, look less uh, about access, but when you have access, what do you do with your access? What do you do with data? And we all heard about the data economy, big data, etc. cetera. And, uh, and the problem is people don't want to share data, uh, etc. So th that was the assumption. So where can actually the continent maybe leapfrog? Uh, is there this opportunity of leapfrogging? Um, and uh, we were in the past working with the uh, or team members with the government of Botswana. And maybe some of you know that there is the Mount Science Park, the idea to set it up. And uh, that was kind of the anchor for us. Uh, so, so how could we do? But then we basically ventured into agriculture and the agribusiness, uh, and, and that's basically result. And uh, here uh, I will present uh, what is our roadmap towards uh, more and inclusive. Oh, excellent. So this is actually the introduction. So the, we had the assumption, the approach, and then we went into the agri agribusiness. And uh, yes, when we received the award, and as most of us, uh, COVID uh, was the, or is the issue of post-COVID recovery, but let's face it, there are many other issues, right? Uh, and global events are, seem to uh, not stop uh, with creating more issues. And I think we, we took this into consideration and also the increase of costs, et cetera. So, so agriculture, agribusiness uh, was uh, quite important for us. Um, the, the methodology, I'm really quite lucky that we have a very international research team um, uh, focused on uh, digital development issues, uh, uh, infrastructure and governance. Um, the approach is, uh, was pretty qual qualitative, so we look at all this big research uh, or, or uh, reports available, but we went into interviews and focus group. Um, and really to, to analyze the range of attitudes until this was exhausted, uh, and of course in a, in a, in a tight time frame. Um, and so, you know, what they call the triangulation of, uh, of those methods. Um, the findings. So, uh, we're not, we were actually not surprised, of course, the, from, the, from the continent side, the African Union and other larger institutions, there is a clear roadmap of digitalization. Then when you go on to national level, the government has a roadmap of development and digitalization. Uh, and it's called smart bots. I, I particularly like that word. So smart bots one, of course. And, uh, and it's very supportive of the ideas how we set out. Um, and, um, and then you say, okay, what's actually the most critical element of the development of Botswana, and maybe for uh, other uh, African countries, it's a primary sector, it's agriculture, which takes a lot of, um, uh, it's a, a, big, a big part of the economy and also feeding the people uh, of Botswana. And, and then, um, and then um, in, in Botswana, uh, as in many other countries, uh, stock farming, uh, is uh, smallholding stock farming takes a big chunk of the agriculture sector. Uh, and uh, it is lacking behind in terms of digitalization. So we thought, okay, here we need to do something. This is probably the best benefit to work and to focus our research on that, uh, on that sector. Um, and still we had this idea of this sovereign data sharing. So we, you know, when, when I collect data, uh, I mean, no, when, when, when they're digital data and we want to do something uh, and people do not share the data, small business, bigger business, etc. And what are the mechanisms uh, to share the data? And here comes this notion of sovereign data sharing, uh, or trusted data sharing. So we looked into this kind of uh, technological architecture and uh, basically came up that we need a roadmap. So there's no way we can leapfrog into that area. So we need a, we, we, we need a roadmap. And, um, oops, Allah, yes. And, uh, oops, where's my roadmap now? Here's a roadmap. Um, and the roadmap is kind of looks like f uh, the following. And on, on the first part, we focused during the research. In order to build, actually, a digital ecosystem for smallholder agriculture, that w that's kind of the goal, connect them and utilize the potential 
of digitalizing that uh, that industry, uh, that sector, you need to start small. And the, the idea with A is a crowd farming pilot project. So we actually, during this project, we, uh, we interviewed farmers um, and uh, we got their feedback. And, uh, and you're not surprised that we will not talk about precision farming because precision farming is something uh, big, big agriculture companies are venturing into it. They have the financial means, they have the capacity, but the majority of farmers do not have that. So, so we look first, look, look at crowd farming first uh, as a minimum viable digital tool, um, you know, to get people connected, to, be, to, to build and actually a network of those farmers. And then you, from that pilot project, uh, we go into B, a crowd farming marketplace. Um, so crowd farming is kind of a distant remote farming. Uh, someone in the city basically orders it and then you have to farm a delivering it. So that model is actually uh, not new as countries are doing it, but this is we seem to really support those steps from a pilot project into a crowd farming marketplace in order to digitalize the stakeholders. And the third one would be eventually uh, and so we want to aim high still to build that ecosystem uh, where actually uh, where you go beyond um, the immediate uh, participants like the farmers, the consumers, uh, the traders, but also get involved agri-tech companies and other uh, smaller businesses to participate uh, in that platform. Um, our recommendations is Clearly, uh, it's not technology which sorts out the problems. So we did not a technologicalist approach. Oh, technology will save us. But there is a technology. But obviously, uh, there, there are, uh, there are uh, different uh, problems in agriculture. Uh, for example, uh, market access, skills gap, land reform, water availability, electricity. So it, it would be a mistake just to focus on digital technology to tackle these issues of agriculture. Um, the it must be the the adoption must be really cost ex, uh, cost effective, easy easy accessible, and you need to have a step by step roadmap transformation roadmap. Uh, so leapfrogging the assumption like the idea also that you can go straight into mobile banking. We still see yes there is this opportunity, but it does not work in that linear fashion. Um, and uh, last but not least, and actually quite important. Our report, uh, and um, we are very glad that this is now downloadable, and thank you again for launching it today, is actually an invitation for a, a, a follow-up proposal uh, to set up the first phase, to really start with a pilot project and to get it done, uh, uh, get things rolling in Botswana. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jelenek. Now let me call Dr. Reason Masengu. What you see here is this kind of federated platform. Sorry. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Karen and uh, your colleagues, for giving us this opportunity to carry out a research where the academia and the industry come together to, to share knowledge. Uh, my presentation um, is going to focus on uh, <clears throat> digital financial inclusion of micro, small and medium enterprise of the Kumesa region into electronic business during and uh, post COVID-19 uh, pandemic under the theme um, digital inclusion and, and job creation. 
Our presentation is going to, to, to be like this. I'm going to introduce my research team. Then I will get into the introduction, the research methodology of our research and uh, the conclusions. The research was uh, conducted by uh, three researchers. Uh, Mr. Forbes Makudza, who is a lecturer of marketing from Manigaland State University of Applied Science in, in Zimbabwe. And uh, Lucia Mandongwe, who is also a lecturer of accounting for the, the same, same university. My name is uh, Dr. Rizen Masengu. I'm a senior lecturer of, of marketing from Middle East College in Muscat, uh, Oman. I'm also a researcher in uh, digital, market, digital marketing, logistics and supply chain. And I'm also a fellow for the Chartered Institute of, of Marketing. So the, the, the reason why we came up with this uh, type of study is we realize that uh, in Africa, we do have uh, micro and small and medium enterprises, which are contributing a lot of money in, uh, into the GDP of most of African countries. But we realize that in some cases, these uh, operators are regarded as informal or illegal. But at the same time, they are contributing to, to the economy. So we do have quite uh, interesting statistics. Africa, 15% of the world uh, population and 6.2% of this population are internet uh, subscribers, meaning to say it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very small percentage. We also realize that uh, internet penetration in Africa is at 18%, meaning to say Africa is, uh, is lagging behind in terms of uh, adopting uh, technology. So the coming in now of uh, COVID-19, a pandemic, we realize that uh, these MS, uh, MEs were really affected. The, the, the digital divide was now quite clear. And uh, they were excluded in most of, of, uh, of these digital transactions. A conspicuous digital divide is evident and uh, digital and internet and digital technology adoption in Africa is still very, very low. COVID-19 amplified this divide, especially in the Comesa region. Economic advancement, employment creation, all these different aspects were, were affected. And aspects of the contribution of SMEs in creation of employment and uh, eradicating poverty, it was also affected. So literature is also awash with information statistics, which is actually important in terms of ad adoption of, 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 of technology. 43.8% of sub-Saharan population is in urban with 170,000 million uh, internet users. These uh, figures are also showing that there they is really a, a divide. So the major unique contribution of this study uh, is to lay down a business uh, performance for these M SMEs so that they are in a position to survive post-COVID-19 pandemic. So we went on now to do our research using this, uh, the, the, the research methodology our philosophy is purely uh, positivism, and we use the descriptor explanatory design. 385 questionnaires were distributed in five different clusters in Comesa. The first uh, research objective, the results were analyzed using descriptive uh, statistics. While well, the second uh, research objective, we use the re uh, regression analysis. And the third one, we use uh, structural equation modeling. The reason why we incorporated these uh, uh, types of analysis is so that we improve on the robustness of, of our findings. You see this when we present uh, the results. So our clusters were divided into 
There are five different categories. And uh, all countries were clustered into homogeneous groups using GDP. Countries with uh, related GDP, uh, uh, GDP were assumed to be with the same macroeconomic conditions, which influence e-business and digital financial inclusion. So this is how we managed to cluster our, uh, the, the, different, uh, the different countries. So we realized that uh, when we collected data to understand the trends in terms of uh, technology adoption, we realized that uh, MSMEs in, in Comesa were using social media and mobile applications and also websites were also being used in their e-business or in, in, in transaction. 93% of the MS, MSMEs had adopted e-business and we realized that uh, MSMEs in Kenya, Rwanda, and Zambia, they had up to around 93%, which is a very good number. And they were also using uh, this digital application in, in e-commerce, buying and selling. We also realized that e-business was increasing by the level of, of education, meaning to say, the more a small business, the owner gets educated, the more he or she is adopting the um, technologies in, in his business. And we also realized that technology adoption in Comesa, it is the same across uh, the different uh, gender, uh, which is uh, in our study, male and, and female. Social media was uh, used by newer and uh, websites was being used by, by old businesses. We realized that social uh, sorry, media because Dr. of- Sorry, Dr. Pasangu, you have two minutes left. Okay, thank you. We also realized that uh, mobile applications were being used uh, to do B2B and to, to do B2C uh, transactions. Access to internet banking, mobile banking, and mobile money was also uh, clear, especially in Zambia, uh, Rwanda, and Kenya. We realized that uh, these MSMEs uh, were facing a lot of challenges in terms of technology access, issues to do with power and network, operational costs, institutional support and data, issues of data and, and privacy. In our research objective uh, number two, we, taking from our, our, our literature, we identified five different uh, factors, which uh, includes uh, uh, simplicity factors, intrinsic factors. We wanted to see if there is any relationship between these factors and adoption. But surprisingly, these results showed us that there was no any relationship, although uh, literature is showing that there is a, a relationship. Meaning to say, when it comes to Comesa, there are other factors which affect or influence the adoption of, uh, of technology among us, these uh, small business uh, operations. We also went further to try to find if, if there is any relationship between e-business and the digital financial inclusion. And we realized, again, there was no relationship. Because literature is showing us that if a business is, uh, uh, is adopted uh, e-business, we are supposed to have also an increase in digital financial inclusion. So this implies that this uh, is the most interesting part of our research because the variables or the data which is available on the internet, which says that these factors affect uh, adoption of technology, we failed to confirm these results in, in, in Comesa. Our Dr. recommendations, Dr. these Masengu, are our recommendations. one minute left. Please uh, wrap up okay. your recommendations. These were uh, part of our, our recommendations, which among them in, in, include improvement in connectivity, uh, leveraging existing public and private uh, infrastructure. Also, aspect of issues of development. We realize that these MSMEs, they, are, they need to be supported by the government, by the private sector. So all these are part of develop of measures to increase cyber security and raise awareness. Some of these uh, small business failed, uh, they, were, they, were, they fear about their security aspects when they transact online. So these are some of the recommendations which uh, we managed to propose. Thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Masengu, for your uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to now open the floor. We don't have a lot of time in case anyone has any questions to ask our three 
uh, speakers on this very fascinating topic. Yes, thank you, Karen. Just a quick one. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for the presentation. I just wanted to know if uh, how maybe, especially to Dr. Senior and Dr. Genelik, I hope the presentation is the, the presentation is good. Uh, if you have taken the aspect of the as you are working on the financial inclusion, these kind of things. <clears throat> if you have taken the aspect of the urban rural continuum, because you mentioned the aspect of um, agri business, but you know uh, we are talking about bridging digital divide, but also um, the digital it also means to like reinforce the linkages between urban area and rural area, which are the the sources for many ecosystem resources, including foods and these kind of things. I just wanted to hear, to hear about uh, from you about this aspect. How, for you, you think that digital aspect can strengthen the linkages between urban and rural area, especially in the food system, if you are taking into consideration. And especially to Dr. Senior, I just wanted to know, just a quick one, what is the scale of the, your project? Because uh, you mentioned Ghana, but what, where exactly in Ghana? Is it all the bis small businesses in Ghana, or is it a, a specific area? Yeah, just uh, thank you. Thank you for the yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, just a quick, obviously there's a big uh, big divide. Um, we think uh, through that approach, through a marketplace and then into crowd farming, that you could maybe connect the city with the the rural area. Considering you can connect the rural area in first instance, but we see that some of the uh, the smallholders are connected uh, in a in a in a minimal way. So we we. Uh, certain structure issues we couldn't sort out or address in, with that project, and we didn't want to look into access to internet. And this was our premise. We don't want to look into that because we thought, oh, there are other people who uh, research in that. So we wanted to look more. Okay, mm -hmm. you know, once this is a little bit achieved, how can we build a ecosystem around that? And that's still a big challenge as well. So we think uh, with the marketplace where you can we connect first the farmer with the market. I think it's the first achievement. And with the crowd farming, uh, which is basically, as a, as a single farmer, you cannot afford a drone, but if you can combine uh, farmers uh, into, a, uh, into a crowd situation, into groups, uh, you could maybe uh, afford precision farming technologies on the one hand, but also you strengthen that group as a, as a stakeholder group also, uh, uh, which could strengthen uh, you know, their access to markets, et cetera. Uh, especially also in competition with these big farming uh, companies also. So, uh, so we also sp spoke to, to large industrials there. Thank you. Yes, uh, thanks for your question. Uh, so we focused on the southern part of Ghana, and the study was undertaken in three cities. There are reasons for that, because the micro-enterprises, those who have transitioned, majority of them are in the cities because they rely on motorbikes to do delivery and people could order in the villages, people could go to each other's places, so they don't do that. And also these businesses are not registered, so it becomes difficult to identify them, so you have to use like snowballing approach to identify these businesses. So that's how come we focus on the sample, the sample. but thanks for your question. Uh, Dr. Masengu, would you like to also uh, provide an answer? Okay, uh, thank you very much for, for your question. Uh, really, there is a, a digital divide uh, between the, the urbanites and, 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 and the rural. To such an extent that uh, the more you move out of, of urban areas, uh, I'll give you an example because I went to, to collect data in Rwanda, I went to, to Zambia, some of my colleagues went to, to Kenya. You realize that most of the areas where we were collecting data, people are not connected. The reason being that uh, adopting these uh, digital technologies in rural areas is an additional cost. This is a small business, and the cost for to, to get a device, the cost of data, is an additional cost. So that, those are some of the reasons which may now we, we, we now find this the, the divide between the urban and and the rural. In urban, the devices are it's a must. But in rural, they have good options. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you.
thank you. I would like to, why don't we all give a round of applause to our four excellent speakers. Thank you um, for a very exciting. And now let me just pass on, hand over to Mr. Samir Sharma for the next session. Over to you. Thank you, Karen. And uh, it is quite encouraging to see that after lunch, uh, there is active discussions and, you know, we are eager for this session. Thank you very much. But I can promise, as we all know, after the session, we'll have a coffee break. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. We want to be more efficient in this session. So far, we have discussed uh, on health, education, job creation, as we just saw. And this session will focus on vulnerable groups. I want to give you some context for that as achieving global commitments that no one will be left behind as set out in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. That will be possible only if ICTs are available, accessible, and affordable to all, in particular to the disadvantaged groups of society and how we define them. They are persons with disabilities, persons with specific needs, including ind indigenous people, people living in rural areas, women, girl, youth, and children, as well as elderly people. Let me give you some statistics uh, to uh, get things in perspective. An estimated 1 billion people live with the disabilities, which is around 15% of the world population, out of which 80% live in developing nations, where infirmity and disabilities are real drivers of exclusion and poverty. The WHO estimates that globally, the number of people with visual impairments is around 285 million, of whom 39 million are blind. With people over 50 years old, accounting for 82% of all blind people. And further, there are 466 million persons with disabling hearing loss, some 6.1% of the global population. And if you look at the women's ability to access accurate information not only has direct impact on her own survival and disaster resilience, but also that of the wider community. There is a need for innovative and culturally sensitive approach to help more women and girls empower themselves through digital technologies. Bearing this context in mind, this session we will deliberate on digital inclusion for vulnerable persons. We have two distinguished speakers, uh, Dr. Frederick Kenobe, lecturer, Kambogo University, Kampala, Uganda. Uh, who would present on assessment of digital inclusion among vulnerable persons in developing economies. And uh, the second speaker would be Dr. Maniam Kalyanan, Associate Professor, School of Business, University of Nottingham, Malaysia, on reinvigorating elderly population post-COVID-19, pandemic era through digital inclusion strategies, a Malaysian case studies. So without further ado, uh, let me uh, invite Dr. Frederick. So give a big round of applause for sharing the insight on this topic. Uh, thank you, moderator. I, I want to acknowledge the support and the opportunity given to us uh, by ITU uh, to make a contribution uh, to the study and uh, discussion this afternoon. Uh, my name is Frederick Kanove, and our project research focused on an assessment of the inclusion among the vulnerable persons in a developing economy. It was a collaborative uh, study between Uganda and South Africa. Our make the presentation uh, agenda, which is not different from the, pre the previous presentation. I'll introduce the research team. I'll give an introduction to the study. I'll briefly uh, present the methodology, findings, recommendations, and conclusion. Uh, the study was a collaboration, as I've already hinted, between Chambogo University and ICOM Technologies, based in South Africa. Uh, it was a combination between academia and industry. Chambogo University is, is academia, 
and ICOM Technologies Industry. I'll give a brief introduction to our study. Uh, we are living in a, a century that is highly characterized with uh, high level technologies. We are proud of uh, artificial intelligence. We are talking of cloud computing. We are talking of virtualization. Uh, we are automating most of uh, our systems. In such a situation, would you expect uh, the majority of the people to be dig digitally illiterate and highly connected digitally? Unfortunately, uh, the truth is different. The majority of the people are not digitally connected, and there is high level of digital literacy. Uh, according to UNCHR, report 2020, over 4 billion uh, people globally are not having access to digital services. And 90% of these are from our developing countries. Uh, our study contributes towards uh, the ninth uh, SD goal, which advocates uh, for increase access to ICT and a provision of a universal and affordable internet to the global people, especially the developing world. The study aimed at uh, identifying factors that influence digital inclusion among the vulnerable people uh, in emerging economies with focus on Uganda and South Africa. We adopted a qualitative approach. We had uh, a qualitative uh, questionnaire where we, re we got 620 respondents, and also we carried out interviews of about 28 uh, participants. The study sites were purposely selected to help us uh, guide the study. Our data qualitatively underwent descriptive uh, statistics analysis, and the qualitative approach was semantically analyzed. Findings of the study. As a comparative study, we do expect a lot of comparison where we have differences and similarities. We got two major differences. Uh, South Africa is better in terms of uh, IT structures compared to Uganda. And also, uh, their digital, digital literacy is better. But uh, most of the findings uh, show more of similarities between the two countries, both being uh, least developed countries. Key findings. According to the study, uh, we found that the digital active age is between 18 and 35 years of age. Also, uh, it was uh, discovered that the study participants believe that the, their governments and the developing partner can contribute to the reduction of the digital inclusion among themselves. So the key findings, we found that uh, one of the uh, factors influencing digital inclusion gaps among the vulnerable people, we have poor IT infrastructure, especially between uh, the rural and the urban area. Most of the IT infrastructures are based in the urban areas, whereas the majority of the people who are uh, vulnerable are living in the rural areas. Also, the ICT is not reliable, especially in rural areas, due to power issues, and the majority of the people have no access to this infrastructure. 
Another key uh, factor that we found out, uh, there is the existence of inadequate internet access. Most of the vulnerable people have low incomes, so they cannot afford uh, this uh, internet access. Even if the mobile phone has tried to, br to bring closer the internet to the people, but the issue of uh, affordability is critical. And the issue of liability also is critical because up country in the rural areas, uh, the ICT infrastructure is poor. And key among this was the appropriateness of the technology to these people. Most of the uh, technology that they have access to is not appropriate to their needs. Another key factor was the low socioeconomic status. Most of the vulnerable people have low income, they are marginalized in society. So they are given low priority as far as uh, digital services are concerned. And lastly, is the digital illiteracy. Most of them are digitally illiterate. And as such, they need the opportunity uh, to utilize the digital services. That is uh, the need of the day. The anticipated outcome of the study, just in case we manage to reduce the digital inclusion, we anticipate uh, improved uh, better opportunities for the vulnerable people. We are also anticipating uh, improved access to e uh, health services. We anticipate uh, improved access to financial credit. Uh, we anticipate also that these people are mainly competitive in the world, we are digital. Sorry, Dr. Kenobi, uh, you have two minutes to wrap up the presentation. Wow. Thank you. We also anticipate that they participate in the digital economy, and they will be also socially connected through social media. Recommendations. Uh, we recommend a uh, leveling of ICT between rural and, average and urban areas, and we believe the government and the private investors can do that. A bit of appropriate technology that came out very strongly because now the issue is not access to the vulnerable people, but how appropriate is this technology? So the government, Ministry of Education, and humanitarian organization can play a role. Uh, we recommend promotion of human rights because now uh, digital access is a human rights, and the government, legal farmers, and humanitarian organization can play a role. We recommend review and adhere to ICT policies. We recommend integration of ICT in the training curriculum and establishment of uh, some inclusive digital training centers. Conclusion. Uh, digital inclusion among the vulnerable is a reality. But the key thing is not now access, but how appropriate is the technology. There is need now to conduct further research that can help us to provide solutions, especially to people with special needs and the elderly. Our study was uh, conducted in South Africa and Uganda. We believe this might not be sufficient enough for us to conclude for the developing economies. Maybe further studies can be carried out in other continents. And we found out that there, there was the issue of stigma among the, uh, the vulnerable people. So getting information from them was not easy, but we did some uh, awareness before data collection and this did undermine our data. What's the next step? We are not only trying to identify the factors, but also to provide a solution that might be a working solution. As I've already hinted, now the issue is not access, but how appropriate is the technology to the vulnerable people, especially super special needs and the elderly people. So we have conducted a simple pilot study 
in Uganda at Chambago University. Chambago University is one of the higher institutions of learning with the highest number of learners with special needs. So we have tried based on their slogan. They say there is nothing for us without us. So we cannot get a solution of the shelf and provide to them. So we're developing a prototype so far with an interaction with the students, the learners, uh, to provide a solution to them. For example, there are different uh, disabilities. Can we, can we close this now? Please, sorry, the time okay. is up already. OK, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Give a big round of applause. And then we take note that you have uh, captured that the appropriateness of the technology uh, is a very important issue. And I think uh, this is a very insightful uh, uh, you know, uh, understanding that we would be able to look at it in more details. So now, with that, let me now invite Dr. Maniam uh, for sharing his uh, research and finding. Dr. Maniam, floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Amir. Hope you guys can hear me. Thank you. Thank you, ITU, for the funding. Uh, let us wait for the thing. It's not coming. Oh, yeah. OK, uh, this research. conducted in Malaysia, titled Reintegrating Elderly Population in Post-COVID-19 Pandemic Through the Digital Inclusion St uh, Strategy. It's a Malaysian case study. My name is Maniam. I'm from University of Nottingham, Malaysia. Uh, moving on, the agenda, same like what our colleagues have presented. Just quick uh, recap. Many colleagues ask me, where are you from? I say, I'm from Malaysia. They ask me, where's Malaysia? So probably let me give a, uh, like, like a background. Malaysia is sandwiched between Thailand in the north and Singapore in the south. Yeah? So we are in between uh, Thailand and Singapore. Uh, this research was done by three of us, two of us from the academia and one colleague from industry. He came in as a data analytics, as a number of work experience, he himself an elderly population. All right, some background to the study. Uh, we actually did some literature review and came out with a model. We call it Dragonfly model. So where we look at three perspectives, how we can empower elderly population defined as people above 60, 65 years old. In Malaysia, have got like 7% of the population out of 33 million people who are actually aged 65 and above. So we thought, let us look at how can we empower them? How can we help these elderly people from moving them or shifting them, at least their mindset, from perceived as burden society to knowledge force society? That was the motivation. So the dragonfly model was uh, developed based on literature. Then, and then we tested the model uh, with multiple methodologies. We did focus group interviews with care uh, caretakers, with elderly people themselves, with NGOs, with government policy makers. We got about 400 odd questionnaires collected. We did a pilot project in one of the uh, suburban area with about 30 elderly people to see, are they excited about technology? Are they interested about technology? We also had sessions with industry players, especially from telecommunication industry, to see how they can come together and help us. So three main focus of this research, as I mentioned, social part of it, economic part of it, and governance part of it. Yeah? And we look at three main areas, i.e. digital uh, challenges, digital strategies, and digital benefits. OK, so this is the model I mentioned, the dragonfly model, where we look at social dimension, people use technology, people use handphones, iPad, and whatnot basically to watch videos, YouTube, Facebook, and many of these elderly people, they use uh, technology to talk to their grandchildren, right? Because a number of them are in Malaysia, overseas, they use it, then talk to their friends and whatnot. Very little found on economic dimension where either they don't know or nobody sort of guided them. Governance dimension, almost zero. Things like e-participation, uh, e-democracy, e and whatnot was not found. Uh, in, based on the study. This is the dragonfly model that I mentioned. Now, say so some of the key findings, right, probably too, too small, be it uh, qualitative research, 
there is a great recognition that yes, Malaysia is a developing country. We don't have much problem with technology uh, providers. We have number of providers reasonably priced. No doubt, government got ambition by the year 2025. They want to give free internet access to everyone. To date, we pay something like 10 to 20 US dollars a month, which is uh, affordable. Uh, people have got at least phones, if not smartphones, their phones to talk to their friends. And uh, many students, uh, at least, they all can afford to have uh, I mean, laptops and computers at home. So that is what we found. And we found that people are, as I said, excited. The point in mission case study, when we talk to them, they are excited about technology. They want to learn, they want to explore, and importantly, they want to benefit from technology. This is coming from almost 80% of the respondents uh, in aging between 65. And our oldest respondent, he was like 93 years old, and he said, yes, give me a chance to learn. I use uh, technology to talk to my grandchildren, talk to my friends. I can do more than that. And I want to sell things online. I want to have online classes and whatnot. But in his case, he doesn't know how to do it. So there is great interest. Now what is lacking is how can we support this great interest, right? That takes us to the recommendation where we're talking about we cannot do it alone. We need all stakeholders, as mentioned by my colleague earlier. It is not only by one stakeholder, everyone should come. And we believe from this uh, study that government should champion the project. It must be top down and it has to be championed by the government. And then we invite private sector providers, we invite NGOs to teach how, and we invite academicians also to teach how. In fact, we did a pilot project in a local university using the university infrastructure invited about 30 people to be with us for a week to teach them how to use technology and rewarded them with certificate and all that. We found at least 80%, 90% were excited. So what government can do? From government side, they need to come out with digital inclusion policies for senior citizens. They need to promote strategic partnership. And of course, government need to invest on emerging technology specifically designed, tailor-made for the elderly people. Now, private sector, how can they come in? They need to come out with digital solutions. In fact, I'm talking to Andy from Huawei, right? We have, we have published one article in, in their magazine on this. We are excited. I think Huawei is excited as well. We want to take it to a greater level on, the, on this. And number two, what private sectors can provide is digital trainings to the community, provide secure and friendly products and solutions. That is where the private sector can come. NGOs, they can come, like, you know, volunteers can come and help them to teach, to, to, to guide them on how to use know-how matters, right? Build strategic partners as well for the public and private entities. And we, academicians, how can we come in? Providing support in terms of R&D, research with practical impact, collaborate, uh, collaborate industry and community. Basically, academias are seen as the bridger, as a bridger between the government, the private and the NGOs. And, and paper like this, in fact, this paper we're taken to a next level. We are presented to the government. We're actually presenting again to the new government, which was formed last Friday, hopefully by mid-December. We're going to share with them and see what can they do in, in helping us out, yeah? So in conclusion, taking from where we have done the research, right? Uh, some key points to take home. Number one, digital inclusion partnership model. That is one of the big findings from this research, i.e. digital inclusion partnership model. We need, we need all the stakeholders support, not only money, energy, resources, know-how, R&D and whatnot. Uh, which involve, as I mentioned, people, private entities, public entities at partnership. And number two, point number two, government should champion this, right? It has to be government-led, government champion uh, uh, agenda because it's involving the entire nation. Number three, again, of course, from the research we found, uh, some mindset change is essential. No doubt they're excited, but the fear of technology is still there. They find that, you know, I'm not sure how to use it. Is it tough? Uh, you know, issue of security and whatnot still sort of bothering people at that level. So 
uh, in in conclusion, therefore, looking at that my diagram on the right hand side, the three elements came out strongly from research. One is the experience of using it, the digital experience, which also includes the benefits and digital challenges, which can be overcome with appropriate digital training and coaching. Number two, behavior. Behavior can be modified. Behavior can be influenced with the right knowledge, right. Uh, training again and the right interference and number three aspirations definitely they are excited we can do more we can get public policy public uh, leaders government officials to come uh, to support this and social relevance make it relevant to them and taking it ultimately to the aim of the study i.e digital relevance empowering the senior citizen elderly people in three perspectives mentioned yeah one is the social perspective governance perspective and economic perspective. And that is what we call the dragonfly model of the study. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Maniam. Very insightful uh, presentation, the dragonfly model. And I take note of the very interesting insight that you provided, uh, especially uh, the digital inclusion partnership model and also the mindset. Uh, the senior citizens, sorry, I think it is done already. Uh, the senior citizens uh, themselves could be the champions. And in fact, they are the ones who could be the leaders rather than uh, seeking for support. I think this is a very uh, inspiring uh, uh, suggestion. Uh, and I also take note earlier, uh, the session was given for appropriate use of technologies. So with that, maybe I would like to open uh, the floor uh, for pressing burning question before the coffee break. One question. Yes, please go ahead. Introduce yourself and please uh, also uh, tell us whom you want to direct your question to. Yeah, I'm uh, Mr. Daronco Giuseppe Lorenzo. Uh, I'm a staff uh, ECA and I would like to speak in French. Thank you. La, mon, ma question va à ton adresse pour le deuxième intervenant concernant la Malaisie, où j'ai trouvé la. La, la présentation très intéressante, mais je me suis amusé à faire un petit calcul, puisque je crois que dans, je parle sous le contrôle du présentateur, d'après ce que j'ai vu, on est parti des, une tranche de catégorie de personnes de 60 ans et plus, en les catégorisant de personnes âgées. Et si on regarde, nous sommes dans 2002, si on remonte le temps, ça veut dire que ce sont les personnes qui sont nées en 1962. En 1962, quand on regarde l'évolution de l'informatique, le premier PC est à Paris dans les années 1980. Alors la question que je me posais, en toute, en toute, en toute je veux dire, innocence, est-ce que cela veut dire que le système malaisien en 1980-90 n'était pas au niveau du système européen éducatif Est-ce qu'il y avait un grand retard Ou alors euh, on devrait peut-être revoir la notion de personnes âgées et démarrer plus loin à 60 ans Voilà, merci. Basically, yeah, just if I may, I also try to catch up just a little bit. Uh, if I understand the question correctly, uh, it's talking about the Malaysian model. I say the computers were introduced uh, in the 80s, and then uh, you're talking about the people who are like 60 plus, etc. They were born at that time, you know, much, much earlier. I mean, how it is, uh, you know, it is impacting uh, this kind of model that you talked about, the three-pronged uh, model how uh, are you a Malaysian government is able to customize it in the context of those elderly people and the technologies please oh, okay now uh, uh, just to give some context yeah uh, our literacy rate about almost 98 percent and uh, technology is quite cheap in this country right so uh, COVID was basically the push factor for people to learn and this study was conducted in the urban and suburban area where people are generally educated, they know how to use technology. Uh, we did our pilot in, in a, in a, in a suburban area where people don't even have smartphone to start with. But, but looking at the model, right, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, in terms of the social perspective of the dragonfly model, people are using technology. But where we are coming from is, why are we stopping them at that level? Can we bring them to, to another level, i.e., on the governance level, 
i.e. on the economic level right we want them to we want to empower these elderly people they want to be independent uh, because sometimes they are perceived as wasting time in technology chatting with friends so where we are coming from is how can we uh, let them have fun with technology at the same time if they can earn some income they can involve in the democracy of the country example in the last uh, election we had uh, last week yeah we also had online discussions and participation in fact i i contacted few of my respondents i invited them to be on the uh, online platform some of them responded positively they felt nice because they could contribute they are not physically able to attend that the public forums but from where they are zoom call and google meet and all that they could involve and participate and, and say what they want to say so i'm not sure if answer the question uh, if i got it correct from samir that is my response so this model is not only for elderly people definitely can be copied and pasted to everyone we just testing it at that level thank you dr maniam thank you very much for this comprehensive response uh now i hear there are a couple of more questions but maybe we take the opportunity of coffee break and if i can request you to come back around uh, uh 4:20 if it is agreeable to so uh, give a big round of applause to our two uh, panelists and thank you very much for joining this discussion Take. 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 
Jake. Jake, Jake, Mike, Jake. Mike, Jake. Thank you. 